This is our final video of this training series. And in this video, we're gonna focus on how everything was placed into a single action setup. But we're also gonna talk about some of the workflow tips as to how to work more efficiently when you're working with geometry, such as this watch that was modeled 100% inside of Flame. So first of all, we see there is our batch schematic with an action node and several different layers with different inputs that were used to create and model and create the effect of the end result. For example, here's a noise image and we have the caustic image we created with a color correction applied to it. If you remember, we used that for the reflections on several different elements of the watch. We had a white still image that was HD there's a white square, there's a circle that we used, and then there's the gradient we used. They are all used for modeling and the reflections and different parts of our scene. With the action node selected, I'll hit the tilde key to step in, and you can see all the nodes that were created. Obviously, time is taken to organize the nodes and know where they are, but it's also really important to naming. So the main axis of every group, I would name it base, inner base, inner ring, inner ring two, metal ring corner, metal ring rounded. So each geometry group will have a unique name. Now, when working with the geometry such as this, there's several things you can do to speed up the, the playback or the interactivity, especially when you want to keyframe stuff or you're just manipulating or moving different elements in the scene. So that's what I want to discuss now is some of the tricks or techniques that are used to speed up the workflow, especially when you're creating keyframes or you're, you're animating something, you want to be able to work as fast as you possibly can. And speaking of the animation, there was two different ways of creating the animation. The animation, the end result of the animation is there's a zoom in on the watch. In this first setup, it was the camera that was animated so that it moves in and dollies in closer to the watch. If we go back to our schematic and I can move up over here, this is where I have my lights and the camera set up. I like to keep these at the top of my schematic so I know where they're always at. If I select the camera, you can see there's keyframes for its position and its rotation. Then we put an extra axis on top of that for further control of the camera. Now we go back to the end result once again. I'll go to the viewing menu and switch this to our action 3D views and choose side. Now we're looking at the side of our scene and we're looking at the side of the watch. Let me hit the I key to turn our icons on and there you can see our camera and it's selected currently. If I scrub through some frames, you can see the camera is moving closer to the watch and there's a slight rotation taking place. I'll hit Alt 2 to get two viewports. On my left view, I'll go back to my viewing options and let's look at the side again in this viewport. Now this is one method of creating the animation. Now we could also have had a master parent axis that controlled every part of the watch and animate that. So let's take a quick look at that. So let me load that setup, the one with the axis animation. Now, when we go into the schematic for this, you're gonna see where we have one axis that is controlling everything, every part of the watch. First of all, I'll go to the camera and I'm gonna delete the axis that is above it. We don't want that anymore because we're not animating the camera. And you'll notice if I select this camera, there are no keyframes on it. The camera never changes its position. And if I go down here, you'll see this is the master axis that is apparent to every part of the watch, all the geometry. Now with that axis selected, we can animate the position and the rotation of the watch. Let's go back to our end result. We start to rotate this. Well, first of all, turn on auto key. So now we'll start creating keyframes at the first frame. I can change the Z position, pull it away from the camera, rotate it on the X and the Y. Then we can go to our last frame. Again, we'll adjust our Z position to have it move closer to our camera. And then adjust your rotations and we've created an animation this way. If we go back to our side view once again, and let's zoom back in our view. 
not the actual axis, the actual viewport. I'll hit I to get our icons displayed again. So now the camera is not moving, but the object is moving. I'll go back to the first frame and you can see this is where we positioned it. This is how we rotated it at the first frame away from the camera. It's a static camera and as we start to scrub forward we can see our geometry, our watch is what we've keyframed and that is moving toward the camera. This is the alternative or second way that I could have animated this. I'm going to go back and load the first setup mainly because with this axis connected to everything it's a little crowded and it's hard to kind of explain what some of these groups of nodes are. So I'll load the first setup that we were looking at which is called the camera animation. So as I said earlier, when you're creating your animation, you want to optimize your setup the best you possibly can so you can be as interactive as you want. And then when you go to create the final render, you can set stuff back to be in higher, whether it's anti-aliasing or higher poly count and so on. The first thing to do is be in 3D view, not live preview. If you're in live preview, Flame is going to try to render what the end result is going to look like, whether it's the different camera effects or, or the actual quality of the image and the geometry that you're working with. But 3D, when you're in 3D, you're gonna be much more interactive because you're not taking into account all that other processing. Also, go to your batch preferences. Set the hardware anti-aliasing to none. And also from the node preferences from your action setup for software anti-aliasing, set this to one, sample one. Also, if we go look at our camera and our light setup, you'll see that we do have a stingray ambient inclusion, the stingray reflection, the stingray depth of field, and we have our shadow cast on our light. But I have all of them hidden right now while creating the animation. But as I just said, when you're in 3D view, these things are not taken into account. But I still like to hide them so that if I do go to live preview while adjusting my animation, I'm not calculating them. Also, depending upon how heavy your scene is, you might want to set the polygon account for your geometry to be a lower number. For example, let's zoom in on one of the buttons over here on the left side of the watch. Right now it is in a draft state because I've decreased the polygon account. Let's select it. First of all, I'll hit the I key to bring up the uh, icons and then I can select the actual G mask that was used to create this shape. Now I can go back to my schematic view and I can zoom back and pan over and I can easily find the geometry setup for that button. It's highlighted in yellow. I'll go over here and I'll select the 3D shape that is part of this and go back to our end result view and then go to the profile settings for this shape and you'll see the max samples and it's set to 10 right now. The default is 200 and if I change this to 200 while watching the actual geometry, you'll see how it's going to become a much higher res model when I enter 200. It's much smoother because there's obviously more polygons to allow it to create the shape. But like I said, when I'm just creating keyframes or making the animation or creating the light setups, I don't need to have the highest polygon possible. I generally will set this max samples to a smaller value. For example, like 20 or even as low as 10. Switch over to our geometry and instead of looking at a solid object, we can enable wireframe, which this also will help you really be more interactive and create the animation faster. So now you can see that we have a lot less polygons here, which means it's more interactive. But if we go back to our profile and we put our max sample back up to 200, now obviously this is gonna be a little slower because there's more to compute while manipulating and animating. Also another great tip is isolating and hiding things that you don't need that are not relevant to what you're working on at that moment. For example, let's say I needed to manipulate these buttons. I need to change their position. And if you remember the way we created them and the setup that we did, we have a specific axis I can use to easily rotate them along the edge of the watch. Now, I don't want to have the watch. I don't want to have all these other elements of the watch visible while I'm adjusting that. So what I can do is this. So I'll go back to my schematic and I'm gonna switch my selection option to all. So everything is now selected. I'll hit the H key and now everything in my scene 
is hidden. Now I want to select just this branch, which is the setup for those three buttons. So I'll switch to branch for my selection option and then select the top axis for that. And now I'll hit H again to unhide the setup for these three buttons. Now, if we go back to our end result, we see nothing because the lights are still hidden. But if I hit the I key, I can see the icons. They are there. It's just that the lights are hidden. Let's go back to our schematic once again, and we know our light setup is at the top. So I'm just going to navigate my schematic to where those lights are. Once again, there's my camera and my light groups. I'll switch my selection mode to selected, and I will unhide these two lights. And then I'll hit F4 for my result. And here we are back looking at our scene, but now we only see these three buttons. So now I can go back to my schematic and I can navigate to its group of nodes and I can make an adjustment to it. I can use the parent axis to adjust all three buttons at one time, or I can select the main axis for each individual button and make adjustments to that. So for example, I'll select this axis, which is controlling the middle button, and then I'll take the Z rotation and make an adjustment to move this button over here. Go back to my schematic and select this button, the axis that controls this other button. Back to the main view, back to our result view, and I can adjust its Z rotation to affect where it is. And I was able to do so very quickly because I wasn't having to compute anything else that was in the scene only the part of the watch that I have to focus on. And then when you're done and you want to bring everything back or unhide everything, switch your select mode once again to all, and then I'll hit the H key. Now, because the fact that the buttons were not hidden and neither were the lights, they are now hidden because I just hit the H key. So we need to go back into the schematic. I'll switch my selection mode to branch select the top axis for those three buttons and hit the H key to unhide those. Now I'll go to my lights and I'm going to select each one of them and unhide those. I actually just unhid the shadow cast. I'll hide the cast shadow again. And as I said earlier, spending the time to organize your nodes in your schematic view for action and then also naming things properly to easily find them really does help a lot when you're working with a complicated scene such as this. So that's the end of this series. I hope you've learned a lot from it. I want to thank Elper again for sharing this amazing setup that he created and letting us use it as our tutorial. This is Ken LaRue from Autodesk. Thanks a lot for watching.